All right, I'd uh, like to invite our panel discussants to the stage. In addition to Dr. Simpson, Coyne Beasley, Beers, and Newton, who have already been introduced, we welcome uh, Ms. Cheryl Gay Stolberg, Washington correspondent for the New York Times, who covers the intersection of health policy and politics. The panel topic, Building Pediatric Capacity Solutions, addresses the needs and solutions for creating resiliency in the US healthcare system to manage children every day in disasters and in pandemics. We encourage those present in the uh, auditorium uh, to find a microphone and ask your questions. Additionally, if you are joining us virtually, um, please enter your questions into the Q&A, not the chat, um, and Dr. Batshaw will be monitoring the Q&A. As you are preparing your questions, um, we'd like to start with a few remarks from Ms. Gay Stolberg. Um, really focusing on the public and media per, uh, perception of the impact of the pandemic, specifically on children and families. Thank you. Let's see. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, sounds like you can. Um, well, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what you heard here today. We know that children are at less severe risk of COVID-19. Um, we, of course, don't know what will happen in the future than adults, but I would argue that they're really suffering from the after effects of the pandemic. In December of 2021, as Dr. Beers showed, uh, the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy put out a report on uh, mental health, saying that it was a crisis among children. And th these are statistics from before the pandemic. Between 2001 and 2019, the suicide rate for young people ages 10 to 19 jumped by 40%. And we know that the pandemic has only made things worse. Um, that month after the Surgeon General's report, I set out to write about the effects of children. And the story I wrote was headlined, Children Coping with Loss Are Pandemic's Forgotten Grievers. And it started with some anecdotes. Um, a mother whose husband died of COVID-19, he was a hospital worker, told me that she got an alarming text message from one of her son's friends. The son was talking about self-harm. Uh, she hurried up and signed him up for grief counseling. Um, a disabled veteran told me that he was struggling to find help for his 14-year-old daughter. His wife had died. Um, he was watching her suffer and he felt helpless. Um, a Rita teacher told me that she was paying out of pocket $200 a session for her three-year-old to have therapy because the child's father had died. Um, the story noted that Congress had allocated trillions of dollars to combat the pandemic, more than $100 million for existing children's mental health programs, and $122 billion for schools. But there were no initiatives specifically designed for the tens of thousands of children who have lost parents or caregivers. At the time I wrote my story in December of 2021, I think it was 167,000 children in the, U the US alone. I'm sure it's much more than that now. Um, the story was tied to a report by the COVID Collaborative. And if you don't, all don't know about the COVID Collaborative, you're, you're nodding your head. Um, you know, I urge you to find out. It's a group of experts in economics, education, and health. It's a who's who of, you know, former surgeons, general governors, academics, you know, doctors, public health experts, um, and they were particularly interested in the effects of children. And yesterday, knowing that I was coming here, I reached out to Gary Edson, who is the president of the collaborative, um, and I want to read to you what he sent to me. I asked him. What could hospitals do? And has Congress taken any steps to address the needs of children? And I'm just going to read to you um, what he wrote. Some of it might sound obvious, but I, th I do think it's worth hearing. He writes to me, hospitals can prioritize children from vulnerable communities in their response plans. Pandemics can be di particularly difficult for children who may struggle with anxiety and stress related to the outbreak, obviously, especially those who have lost a parent or caregiver. Hospitals can prepare by developing mental health resources specifically for children, such as counseling services, support groups, and educational materials on coping strategies. Hospitals can also increase their investment in their telehealth infrastructure that can deliver mental health services virtually. 
He writes that uh, his collaborative is hoping that children impacted across the country can have access to support groups, mentor programs, bereavement camps, educational materials, and financial in information about federal, state, and local monies available to them. Um, Congress has not responded with any legislation, but President Biden did include language in an executive action last year about the need to support children who have lost a parent or caregiver to COVID. And some states, uh, Gary writes, have passed bonds to do this, while others have used their Recovery Act dollars to hire additional support staff in schools. Um, I also reached out to Pamela Addison. She's one of the parents who I mentioned a few moments ago, and she wrote to me that hospitals have all these programs and outreach for everything but children and their grief. And she lost her husband, who was a hospital worker, and she she made a point which I thought was really interesting that hospitals also need to attend to their own staff and the families of staff who are going to be the frontline workers in any pandemic. Um, and they're, you know, they, they suffer too. Um, so I know that, you know, all of you, you're primarily concerned or, or maybe not primarily, but you are concerned with developing bed capacity and do I have enough nurses and, you know, all the other kind of infrastructure things that go along with pandemic preparedness. But I think it is useful to conceptualize hospitals as community resource centers, um, especially children's hospitals for children and their families. Um, and in that effort, I do think there are ways to enlist the press. That's probably why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I have a few ideas based on what I heard this morning and um, I think I'll turn it back over to you. We'd love to hear them. You would love to hear them now or? We'd love to hear them now. Um, I just think there's an interesting story in this whole initiative and in so, in so much of what I heard today about, um, you know, the lack of preparedness, the lack of disaster planning for children. Um, yeah, it, it occurred to me that I wrote children are the pandemic's forgotten grievers, but I could have just put children are the pandemic's forgotten, period, um, because it seems like there's really not been any attention paid to, to planning. Um, for, and we know that children are going to be suffering the after effects of this pandemic their whole lives. We've seen what educational, you know, school closures have done and, you know, death and, you know, injury and, in, you know, illness to their parents. So I think what you all are doing is really interesting. And I can't promise I'll write about it right away. <laughs> and I can't even promise that I'll be the one who writes about it. But I, I think I will talk to our editors about, about this as an issue. We're grateful. Thank you. Um, if we can start, I'll put the first question and uh, the right of first refusal to Dr. Coyne Beasley. Um, and this is a question um, really touching upon something you described earlier. The pandemic obviously has had lasting effects on all, but gaps in equity, as you pointed out, were exacerbated during the pandemic. Technology became a way um, by which we minimize contact to flatten the curve, right? When we think about that curve of spread, we were trying to, over time, minimize uh, contact, maximize distancing, allow us time to always stay under that overwhelming capacity and capability curve uh, that would denote our inability to manage uh, patients, including children. So as we looked at strategies to flatten the curve, technology drove uh, much of that. Schools went virtual. Um, we all suddenly became familiar with Zoom meetings. Um, and But the challenge is that access to internet is not um, equal with all. Uh, telehealth went gangbusters. But again, technology is not equal for all. Can you can you speak to how we can begin to bridge the gaps for technology, not just for those who can't afford the access, but as we think about the geographically remote areas, the rural communities where technology may also be unreliable, how do we begin to think about strategies for improving access? 
a very easy question. No. <laughs> uh, no, but it's actually something that's incredibly important. And I also want to make sure that we understand while we utilize technology, that it doesn't, it's not the be all end all solution, because many of us know that many of our young people suffered because not everybody is a visual, virtual learner, that they actually require contact and socialization. And I'm going to be really interested to see what happens five years from now from our adolescent and young adult population, as well as children who have missed that opportunity. But one of the things that is really important is that we can use technology to help us better address the technology gaps that we have. As you saw through some of the mapping that we did and that others have done, we can already identify those areas that are going to have or already have difficulty with accessing um, technology. And so one of the things that some people did, and hopefully we can uh, utilize kind of national efforts to expand broadband to actually go to those areas that we know are already underserved. The other piece of that is like, what is the technology that everyone can utilize? Not everyone has a computer. So even putting broadband doesn't you know, alleviate the problem. But what is one thing that people have? And I left it in my bag, my cell, cell phones. Phone. So almost 90% of people have a cell phone. So if you can get them cell phones and access to be able to utilize that. And there were many communities that actually gave people cell phones and the ability and capacity to use them. And then that other piece is once we identify where those areas are, it requires us to go back to those boots on the ground and get to those places that may not be able to communicate through the technology that we can potentially provide. And that means, and that's what I'm hoping that we'll do as a, a pandemic network, is identifying those partnerships, identifying those local leaders who have the capacity, whether they're a, a pastor in a church or a community health worker, who can go to those, those locations that we can map out quite um, you know, down to the street level uh, and actually provide the information that's needed. And so some of that information will be needed to individuals, some will be needed to community hospitals, but also schools. And as we broaden our partnership, I think that we have some capacity to do that, but it has to be really intentional. We've got a head start on um, thinking about what we need to be doing, but thank you for that question. I appreciate that. And I appreciated your slide with all of the deliberate efforts of the um, equity domain. Um, Dr. Batshaw, do we have any questions in the Q and A? And uh, uh, one question and comment uh, from uh, Dennis Wren. Um, he appreciates all the work that people and organizations here are doing. Sometimes he says, "I find it discouraging to see the politicization of uh, science and the dysfunction of our government. Many of the initiatives here would benefit from system level changes." How do you think we can overcome these barriers? Cheryl, do you want to start on that? <laughs> well, it's it's actually very interesting that this is a topic that I've really been thinking a lot about, the politicization of science and why is it that the pandemic, that the loss of trust that resulted from the pandemic response has evidenced itself in partisan ways, that we seem to have a democratic and a Republican approach to public health. And I, I don't really have any good answers to this. I, I asked Tony Fauci this question recently, and frankly, he didn't have any good answers either, except he said, we've got to stop fighting with each other. But I will say this, I think that because you are all focused on children, actually you have an advantage in Washington. Um, children are a way to get Congress's attention uh, this is the reason we have S-CHIP. Teddy Kennedy and Orrin Hatch got together and put together the S-CHIP program. Kennedy wanted to do universal health care. That was always his dream. Um, but he knew he couldn't do it. He knew he couldn't get universal care, but he could get care for children. And that's what and that's what they did. So I, I do think you're pushing on an open door. And also, certainly in the administration, um, <coughs> I know that the Surgeon General is very, you know, is concerned about children and, and the secretary um, just from my conversations with them. And um, so I don't I don't have a great answer for the question about how do we overcome this politicization. But but I do think you folks are better off than most. Oh, I think that's really true. And and. You know, I'd love to add a few things. Uh, I also thought about this quite a bit over the past few years. You know, and I, I think that that one, your point about 
a focus on children is really important because it does center us back into a, a shared value. I do also think that sometimes that can take us awry, right? I mean, I think there are ways not to take us awry, but I think that there are ways that that can be politicized as, as well. And so actually one of the things that we really thought about a lot uh, with AP was also just the importance of the, the local pediatrician and the local child health expert, because it is easy to sort of target an organization or call out an organization, but it, when it's someone you know, right, when it's your, your, your local pediatrician, it's your local child health expert, your local school, those conversations become um, uh, much more meaningful, right? And so thinking about how we support our local pediatricians, I would also say, I do I do think another piece, and this is, I, I think, a bit related to this, a bit actually maybe related to some of your earlier comments about how children are forgotten. I do think it's important to continue to elevate the real needs of children, um, the real impacts of them. And I think it's important to have pediatric voices do that. Um, I think it was a continued frustration, uh, it continues to be a continued frustration for me when I see children's issues being discussed. Um, and there's not a single pediatrician or child health expert in the group discussing children's issues. And so, and, and, and I, so then I think those issues sometimes, um, you know, the, 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 the full nuance of them doesn't get addressed. So I, I think those two things is really elevating the pediatric voice in sort of all those discussions and, and also really leaning heavily on that trust, um, that, that pediatricians and pediatric health professionals of all sorts have with the families in their communities, because that's where the real conversations can happen outside of politics. If I could just jump back in quickly on this idea, of, I don't want to hog the floor, but um, I went to Wyoming uh, to write about vaccination in middle schools. How were how were school nurses and public health people tr trying to get kids vaccinated in a red red state where there was a lot of resistance to vaccination? And it was it was really fascinating to see some of them, um, some of the nurses were not even arguing for COVID vaccination. They had signs up in this high school gym and it said, you know, vaccination, not mandatory. And then they had, you know, HPV and they listed like the COVID vaccine embedded it in, you know, in all these other vaccines so that it just seemed like, okay, this is just one of a number of vaccines and we're not pushing the COVID vaccine. But I thought that was interesting because it was a really localized response. And I do think that's, what you need. And I frankly think, um, I don't know, well, someone is from the Biden administration is here, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think this is a, I think the administration did a great job in, um, in addressing hesitancy in poor communities or in minority communities, but did not do a good job. And maybe because they weren't great messengers in rural communities or red areas of the country. And, um, I think perhaps they did need, you know, different messengers. The president, Tony Fauci, were not great messengers for that. I, I want to make certain that we don't miss the second part of that question, which was all about systems change. Um, and, and as we think about you know, wearing a quality improvement hat here, as we think about a Don Abedian structure that we've got to establish adequate structures, put in the right processes if we're going to get to the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Our focus uh, for the PPN, as we have heard, many elements of this are about addressing structural change, whether that is the microsystem of the structure in an organization, an emergency department, a PICU, whether it is the mesosystem of that community's or that region's uh, participation in uh, preparedness groups, whether that is the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, we start with a lot of that structural change. And I would ask Dr. Newton, you brought up um, the issue of pediatric readiness and structural change related to what the American College of Surgeons has done to ensure that pediatric readiness in all facilities, even primarily adult facilities that are undergoing trauma verification, include those pediatric readiness components. What impact do you see that having? Are we talking about a handful of hospitals? Are we talking about a broad sweep? No, thank you. It's um, uh, this is potentially massive change, um, and it's really significant. This is coming in uh, beginning in 2024. Every trauma hospital knows about this, so it's already been announced and released. So they're all at the stage right now trying to prepare how do I pass my site visit next year? 
which means they've got a new box to check. And that is, how are you taking care of kids? Um, now, the interesting you know, aspect of this, you know, when I talked, I talked a lot about um, uh, the bad science that we, that we deal with. This is one of the areas where there's good science, okay? There is tremendous data that supports if you have a PEDS ready program and a survey and a PEC, that saves kids' lives, which is a very significant statement. Yep, the, excuse me, the PEDS emergency care coordinator. I, did I say PEC? I'm too, I'm too ingrained in it, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so PEDS emergency care coordinators. Now, one of the problems currently is how many hospitals around the country have invested in that? Um, a lot have, some haven't because it's an investment or the position rolls over or that position is not empowered and, you know, is not connected. And, um, uh, that's, that's where we have an opportunity to change the system as, the, as the question was talked about. Um, a uh, good example of this, uh, Dr. Coyne Beasley brought up in, in, in her talk, uh, program in Utah that is empowering uh, the emergency care coordinators on Indian health services with telesim programs and connecting them with information and skill and train the trainer and revolutionizing what they are able to do uh, for kids in an area that historically has struggled. Um, that's transformative. So this is coming and it's coming everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Simpson will give you the right of first refusal on this one. Um, the need for data analytics and data to insights, effective data interpretation during the pandemic and during the surge was often criticized for being slow to describe children rather than only adult surveillance. And that had ramifications for contextualized meaningful data in local areas or regions to inform real time bed capacity, bed capability, the ability of consultants, uh, and all that might be necessary to effectively manage children. As we saw the closure of some 20% of pediatric facilities over the last decade, that's over a thousand pediatric beds, many of them converted to adult beds during the initial surge, never converted back, that data became critically important. Where do you see the PPN's ability to use analytics as a key driver of the work for the future? That's an excellent, also easy question. Thank you. <laughs> um, and um, I think really germane to PPN is the fact that it's a network. And what is really beautiful about the spread of our network is this transdisciplinary approach to everything we're doing, whether we're the head of a surgical department, an adolescent division, an emergency department, and the impact of the data and metrics we use to run those divisions within our communities, responding to the patient populations that we particularly serve, and then gathering that to figure out how we change the system, as the question was just asked, uh, to address the issues that we see in the day-to-day -day living through the pandemic. Um, being able to look at our network from a larger level and figure out what are the core data points that now we're able to, number one, advocate for resources to improve the, the problem, or number two, develop the metrics that says that the, to get to the outcomes that we believe children deserve, here are the steps that we collectively think about um, in, in figuring out which metrics across the various environments that our hospitals sit in, in order to advance um, uh, the solutions. So a very complex way to answer your question. I think the, the way that PPN really has the advantage is that it's just such an amplifier of what our communities are experiencing, the lenses within which we sit for the different disciplines within PPN to now give that national narrative so that our New York Times or our uh, political uh, um, uh, networks um, or, and so forth can really get the, the clarity that's needed in order for us to be uniform in our approach. Uh, very insightful. I, um, I think back to what we heard from uh, Dr. Dixon, the science of everything that we want to grow in pediatric disaster science. And to your point, we really don't have established, well-socialized, well-vetted, and well-accepted metrics around pediatric disaster readiness. Um, so thank you for that. Um, all right. So... I have um, 
two more minutes before we make a couple of comments. So uh, one question for Dr. Beers. Uh, given your past presidency of the AP, how do you see the ability to mobilize and link the work of influential professional societies in prioritizing mental well-being, especially thinking through this transdisciplinary approach to the work? I guess I have the easiest task of answering that in 90 seconds. <laughs> but I, I think I, I can just make a couple of comments. I mean, one of the, these points has been made before, which is the, the ability of national organizations, um, both individually and collectively, to see the really big picture, I, I think is incredibly important. And I think that's the case for mental and behavioral health, but it's also the case um, for lots of other things. I mean, I think back to early in the pandemic um, when we were, we, we with a together, AAP together with others was doing that type of, of work. We were really getting these early warning signs from pediatricians saying, I'm not seeing any kids with ear infections. I have an office full of kids with mental and behavioral health concerns. And we were hearing it not just from one locality, but we were hearing it from across the country. And so that really triggered us to say, I know we're deep into trying to figure out the data and the pandemic response and how, you know, how, what kind of PPE do you use? But we have to start attending to this as well now because it's going to be an issue moving forward. So I think that's one important piece. I think the other important piece is around dissemination um, and scaling of interventions, right? I mean, when yeah. we think about mental behavioral health in particular, if we're going to um, upscale people's skills to be able to support um, um, their patients, um, they, they need additional education and training. And, and these national organizations can be a terrific place to actually disseminate um, scale and disseminate that work and really get it out to, you know, starting nationally, but then getting it out to, to local chapters and then disseminating down from kind of a hub and spoke model kind of thing. So and I probably you. hit 90 seconds more. No, that's good. Um, <laughs> any questions from the audience before our quick summary? Oh, a couple of questions back here. Maybe not so much a question, but just a thought I was having as I'm sitting, like listening to all of this amazing work. And I know the whole PPN network is just building and growing, um, but it made me think of a much, not maybe not larger, but a slightly different pandemic that we've been facing for decades. Uh, as it relates to gun violence and how this is affecting our children across the United States. Um, and just, you know, thinking to myself, you know, this is such amazing work that is developing and building in this way across the nation. How could we potentially leverage the work? And I mean, I don't know that it's something that we would do now because we're just trying to build. Um, but in the future, maybe you're, you're even thinking about this already. You know, how can we leverage this work to really um, protect our children? Um, because it just seems to me that more and more and more you're hearing about these shootings in schools. It's no, you know, it's not as many... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, happening in like maybe a shopping mall or or something like that that you'd hear of in the past. It seems to be all focused on children, and it's just very sad and very disturbing to to think of. You know how this is happening, and just I just feel like the work that's happening here is something that could be leveraged in that setting and really make a significant impact because this is a huge political issue. Um, you know, that I have, I definitely don't have the background to discuss or talk about, but, um, you know, taking it out of the, out of the, um, maybe taking it out of, um, the leaders, the government's hands, the leaders' hands, and really looking at it from more of a healthcare. This is a this is a healthcare. This is somewhat of a healthcare issue, and maybe we should be taking that on to some degree. So I, I'm curious, Ms. Gay Stolberg, yeah. does it fit? Um, so let's see if this is on. Yeah, it's on. Okay. But there's. I've actually written extensively about this, about the issue of violent issue of violence gun violence as a public health problem. And I, I have a super easy answer, which is that there are academic centers. Johns Hopkins has, has a consortium to address gun violence. They, it's at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and they have brought together uh, researchers from 
Duke University and the University of California and all around the country who are doing you know, scientific research on how to prevent gun violence. Um, and th this is the group that came up with the idea of the, the red flag law, the extreme risk protection order. Now, you know, gun violence is through the roof and you can say it's not doing any good, but there are established structures um, to try to bring a public health approach to gun violence. And the CDC is now able to fund this research after a 20 year or so hiatus in which Congress actually explicitly barred the CDC from uh, funding any research into gun violence prevention. In, in 2020, Congress uh, repealed that or, or at least altered the rules so that that work could go forward. I, I just would like to ask something about it. It's a really important question. I think the other thing that you mentioned is about kind of local solutions as well. And so you may have noticed that a lot of the language we used was emergencies, pandemic, and disasters. And quite frankly, many communities view gun violence as a disaster in their communities, if not an emergency. So just to give you a very quick example, um, at one of the youth groups that we actually are, are working with, and as we engage youth in, in communities more, we're going to let them define what those disasters are for them. And what I was alluding to, I didn't get to go into detail, is that the Children's National Hospital Group, as well as the group that we have at UAB, will be doing work specifically geared around training youth advisors and uh, around firearm violence. And, and hopefully you've seen the efforts of youth across the country as it relates to that. So thank you for that question and the attention to local solutions as well. Okay. So in the interest of time, if there are additional questions, we'll be around after the session. Um, I just wanted to uh, make one sort of summary comment about the pandemic network. Um, and that is that what you heard today is that we are a single coordinated network is congressionally appropriated that brings together organizations, children's hospitals and the communities they serve and partnerships to support the resiliency of, US, of the US healthcare system to manage disasters and pandemics, uh, putting children and families in the center. We're supported by HRSA because of HRSA's uh, incredible history of support over pediatric readiness, over pediatric emergency care, over quality improvement, family networks, uh, and all that has brought us today to the successes that we're seeing, that we're able to amplify, and that we are doing in partnership. We welcome your perusal of our website and uh, happy to answer any questions after the session. Larry, do you want to offer our closing remarks? Thanks. I know we're over time here. I just wanted uh, to wrap up, but uh, this was a really outstanding opportunity for us all who've um, gotten to know each other in 2D very, very well over the last year and a half, but to get together and share ideas. Uh, I think there are a lot of really excellent points, and I just want to take a minute just to highlight some things that, that I'm taking home from this. Dr. Batshaw, you, you really highlighted the importance of Children's Hospital collaboration and their efforts in advocacy and how important that is for advancing child health. But advocacy only goes, advocacy only goes so far. And Dr. Simpson uh, highlighted action uh, is the next step, which is incredibly difficult when we're bringing uh, 10 children's hospitals plus community partners plus 100 SMEs um, from all over the country to develop something that's innovative, collaborative, and transformative. Dr. Coyne Beasley, uh, I noted that um, inequities are inequitable. Um, we we have inequities at, at my site, but my inequities that I see are completely different uh, in other parts of the country. Uh, and so uh, having sites being able to identify their specific vulnerable and underserved populations will be very, very important uh, and uh, highlights the strengths of the PPN in terms of synergy uh, and collaboration. Uh, Dr. Beers, uh, I noted that uh, you said something that I, I have had difficulty um, expressing to families in the community that, that COVID-19 did not cause a mental health crisis, and then I, I just uncovered it. Uh, and uh, all of the stressors that contributed to that are, are also inequitable uh, and, and shows that if we address those, there, there's this synergy within our network uh, between mental health uh, and our, our health equity efforts. Uh, Dr. Newton, um, you, you presented a problem and, and uh, of this, this surge uh, and said, well, it was the viral epidemiology and the mental health crisis and the staffing crisis and 
uh, a decline in pediatric services and in, in, in just shows how profound the challenge is that we have moving forward. And so when Dr. Simpson comments on the fact that we need to boil the ocean, uh, I think that highlights why we need to boil the ocean because we have big, big problems. And if we only solve one, we're gonna continue to have issues with addressing pediatric healthcare needs moving forward. Uh, and Ms. Solberg, finally, uh, you pointed out the biggest challenge that I think we've had as pediatricians, and that's communicating uh, and, and grounding public perception and what's important, what's accurate. Uh, and uh, trying to establish common footing as we move forward. And so those are my take-home points. I'm sure others have personal take-home points. Thank you for joining us uh, and have a great rest of your day.